We rock climbers are a different breed. All ages, all walks of life, we are compelled to climb, to tackle this journey together. With a relentless tenacity to climb up the impossible cliff faces, once we begin, there is no giving up. There is no escalator down, no easy way out. We are in it for the long haul. The journey to the top is full of problems and potentially fatal falls. Complete trust in the person holding the other end of the rope is vital to having a hold nothing back, go for the top mental state, allowing us to make bold moves when needed. This belayer must catch the climber when they fall, and we will fall. No one wants to fall, but during that moment, your strength gives out, you've lost your grip, and terror grabs a hold of your heart. That is when your fellow climbers are there to catch you, to help you back up, to look out for your safety. It's crucial that we put complete trust in each other's hands. The ability to work together as one unit will not only get us to the top, it keeps us alive. We are a community of individuals striving to share a common vision and passion to overcome gravity and reach the summit. We're in this together. Well, good morning. Have you had a good week? Has anybody had a strange week? Yes. Is anybody preparing for a strange week? So we're doing this series, and I wanted to continue, and, and I wanted to kind of prep preface what I'm about to do. It's saying if, if, you, if you pay attention, and you're all going to pay attention, right? Um, this really has the power to, to fundamentally change your life. Now, I know that we often say that and, and we kind of go through it, but if you, if you listen, I'm going to give you a choice today that will fundamentally change the course of the rest of your life. So I want you to look for that. So we started down this path called the summit. And I decided to do this because of the necessity that we have for discipleship. The mission of the church is to make disciples of Jesus. And yet, along the way, we often get confused exactly what that means. We often think that it means taking up a space on a pew, or going through the motions, or you know, putting a, a few dollars in the plate. Is that what discipleship means? And so we get kind of lost and we get kind of confused along the way. And so we created a, a process. And for the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about how we can move along in deeper understanding of discipleship, right? And, and you see this in the Gospels, don't you? You see the disciples being transformed, right? Um, Philip goes to Nathan and he says, hey, come and see this guy who, from Nazareth, who's doing all these amazing things. And, and of course, Nathaniel says, really, come on, nothing good comes from Nazareth. We know, we know where that's from. That's at the beginning of the journey, and, and by the end of the journey, they are disciples that are on fire uh, in Jerusalem. What about you? And, and this is the question, obviously, for you. Do you find your own faith journey is growing and thriving? Or have you, like I feel like so many people, are getting stuck. We just have kind of settled into a nice, comfortable routine. Well, I'm hoping that that changes today. I but I want to start by, by um, asking you uh, a question and, and, and obviously giving you a little bit of my perspective. Do you ever say dumb stuff? Okay, we're going to have confession after it, because I know some of you, if you don't think you're saying dumb stuff, let me tell you. So here's the thing, right? Um, I just a little, I'm finding that as I get older, I'm saying more dumb stuff than I used to say. You know, and, and it, it, it's like one of those things when as soon as you say it, you're kind of going, did I really just say that? And I wanted to share just a, a, a couple of really dumb things that I can say on a regular basis. And, and maybe you do too. Maybe you'll see this as well. Right? Have you ever said, how hard can it be? Right? How hard can it be? Uh, maybe it's in, you know, like particularly where you fall into trouble, if you've ever done this, home repair. 
I mean, you see, like, we have people that will tune into HGTV, and oh, there it is. In a half hour, they could tile a whole bathroom, right? How hard can it be, right? In a half hour, they can, you know, they, you have these people that flip houses, so they go in, they gut the place, they tear out walls, put in brand new stuff, and in a half hour, it's all done, right? How, how hard can it be? What about car repair? When I was a kid, my, my dad would show me, actually show me like how to time a car and do the dwell and all that kind of, that's, that's when you could actually recognize where the spug pl- sp- spark plugs were. Now you open it up, you don't even know where they are, right? I'm not gonna go in there and start tweaking and say, right, you open up the hood and you say, well, I mean, how hard can it be? No, because now they plug it into a computer and the computer has to tell you. I mean, do you ever say these kind of things to yourself? But let's, let's think about other things. Let's think about things that are a little bit more personal. Do you, do you ever say, what about relationships, right? Parenting, for those of you that, parenting, right? How hard can it be, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, they're going, man, we should have had a dozen of these things. Because <laughs> they're so easy. They come with instructions, right? I mean, do you ever do that? What about marriage, right? What about personal relationships, right? I, This is the one that I find most fascinating, right? You have young couples come in and you wanna say, look, you know, this relationship is going to evolve. Yeah, I know, but I mean, how hard can it be, right? Marriage, right? Right, I, you know, I, I often ask Lynette, how am I doing? I rarely wait for the answer. <laughs> because, I mean, how hard can it be? Right? I mean, here's a, so here's the thing, right? We know that this happens. We, we know that we can, we can say dumb stuff. But what about, I mean, those are funny things, but what if you take your marriage for granted, going, ah, right? I mean, it doesn't take any planning. It doesn't take any, any thought. What about raising your kids? Well, I can just do whatever, I just wing it. Yeah, and that's usually what what you end up with, right? We need to understand that things are not always as simple as they seem. Okay, let's talk about something spiritual. What about church? What about church? Have you ever said with church, right, how hard can it be? I show up and I leave. Is that church for you? Is that what Jesus had in mind? Is that what we were created for? That's just, we just show up. I mean, it, shouldn't, it should be easy. Church should be a piece of cake. It should make me feel good about myself, right? Is that your idea of what Jesus had in mind? Okay, well, let's go one step deeper. What about Christianity? Your relationship, right? We talked about parenting. Parenting is hard especially in this generation, right? Virtual school, technology, all that, it's, it's, it's hard. What about your relationship with Jesus? Do you think that, oh, well, I mean, how hard can it be? Most people feel, I think the vast majority, most people feel, look, if I say a prayer, if I join a church, if I get baptized, that's all there is to it. That's all there is to it, right? And, and I often say to them, like, have you ever known people that have been married, like 50, you know, long time, 50, 60s, you know, those years? Do you think that when they got married, they say, look, there's, the only thing there is to marriage is ask her to say yes, say yes at the altar, and sign the paper. You're done. That's all there is to marriage, right? And you recognize that there's so much more. So here's the thing about discipleship. Discipleship is inviting you to go deeper. So I did this study. I, I, you know, I, I look for things on the internet to try and say, what are, what, what's, what are people talking about out there? What are the things that are on your mind? And, and I found this thing. When people say dumb stuff, they'll say stuff like this. Go and find your own true north. There is only one true north. 
right? I mean, I want you to imagine that you're going on a, an adventure. You're going on a great ad- adventure. And you just say, hey, everybody, you, you create your own true north. It, you can do that. But there is only one true north. You're going in the wrong direction, okay? So the point here is for everybody to say, I'm going to create my own truth. Well, people end up a lot like this, right? People are overwhelmed. This is what I'm finding right now. People are overwhelmed. They're, they're stressed out. They're burnt out. They're struggling to find where God is in their life. What is true north? If everybody among us says this is the path to go, this is what life really means, no wonder people are burnt out. You're trying to please everybody. You're going in a thousand directions at the same time. You have lost our true north. What direction were we called to do? Should you make it up? Or did God create it? I love this quote by C.S. Lewis. Have you ever heard of him before? C.S. Lewis said, he said, we are half-hearted creatures. We're fooling around with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. What Lewis is talking about here is everybody wants to create their own true north. What is their own meaning? Whether it's truth or whether it's drink or whether it's your career or whether it's the clothes or the possessions that you have, you are far too easily pleased with that simplicity than with what God is truly inviting you to be. So we decided to do something about it, and that's the source of the the summit journey. So here's what I wanted to do. I wanted to give something to you that would so inspire you that would elevate your life, right? The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians, actually it may be Ephesians, excuse me. Paul said in Ephesians, he said, no eye has seen, no ear heard, no mind has even conceived the things that God has prepared for those who love him. Paul is trying to inspire you out of your complacency, out of your simplicity, and out of your rut. He's trying to take you from being far too easily pleased with just showing up on Sunday and going home. He said, we're far too easily pleased with that simplicity. He wants to inspire you. What does that mean? Inspiration means to energize and actually means to write in, inspire, breathe life into. To breathe life into you when the rest of the world is trying to suck life out of you. And so we started with this imagery, right? The idea of the summit, the idea of the mountains, this this journey to be a discoverer, to to make your life an adventure that is worth following. And so we created this idea, and I wanted to implant it in your mind, this idea that what Jesus did is he came into the life, and he came to people like Nicodemus, and he said, Nicodemus, you think you have it all made. You think your company is doing well? right? You think your job is well, you've risen up in the corporation, and he said, Nicodemus, you have to start all over to understand what God is doing. And then he went to a woman by the well, the woman that was the outcast, the woman with the past, and he said, you think your life is done, right? He said, it's just beginning because you were made for more, This is not who you are. This is not who you were created to be. And the day that you were born and the angels laughed at the joy of a new child being born, that's who you are and that's who you still can be. I want you to believe that you are made for more. I want you to inspire you to say, I'm ready to get out of my pew and to do something glorious. Something that at the end of your day, that you can say, I lived an amazing, abundant life. So the first thing I want you to do is I want you to believe that it is possible, that God can still use you where you are under the circumstances that you are. The second thing I want to do is I want to make it an adventure. I want to make it hard. 
I want to challenge you. I, I don't want to just say, oh, so all you have to do is sign this paper and you're in. No. Every adventure worthy of you is going to challenge you. It's going to cause you to stretch. Last Sunday, if you haven't been, last Sunday I, I talked about the wall. There comes a point when if it's worthy, if it is worthy of you, it is going to cause you to struggle. The best story that I can think of for this is the story of Peter. In the upper room, Jesus then takes off his outer garment, wraps a towel around him, and begins to wash the disciples' feet, the the role of a servant. And Peter says, "Uh uh-uh, ain't going to happen. I can't go there. I cannot allow my rabbi and my Lord to wash my feet. And Jesus said, that's your wall. He said, Peter, if you don't, you have no part in me. If you cannot take up the role of a servant, if you're not willing to wrap the towel around yourself and serve others, you have no part in me. That's your wall. That's as far that you go. And I want you to know what that is. You need to know what it is. You need to struggle with it. You need to face it, and you need to see it for what it truly is. Because ultimately, discipleship is fulfilling that adventure. When we talk about discipleship, what are we doing? We're talking about fulfilling that dream that Jesus had for you. You said, I want to be in. I believe in the summit. I believe God is calling me to more. And I'm willing to stretch and to go farther. That's true discipleship. But here's the thing. We often stumble, right? We often lag behind. We, we know that we should, but we don't. And why is that? Why do we struggle so often? Why do we oftentimes get lost? Well, there's a couple of reasons that the Bible tells us about. All of us here today fall into these categories. First of all, everyone here is blind. Everyone is blind. Now, you, you, if, if, you're, if you're serious, you're probably going, I'm not sure that I really believe that. Here's the thing. What is going to happen? What do you think is going to happen in the next five seconds? Right? Oh. How many of you saw that coming? Here, here's, here's my point. I want to do something a little silly. But here's my point. We can't see into the future, can we? You don't know what's going to happen this afternoon. You don't know what's going to happen in your own life. As a matter of fact, Jesus was saying, you know, why do you worry about things of this world? You, ca- you cannot even add one moment to your life. And so we're often blinded. We don't know what's coming. We don't know what's coming down the next hurdle. And so often we just say, well, how hard can it be? It's just all going to come to us. And so oftentimes we get lost because we follow every voice, every, every voice that wants us to do what everybody else is doing. So oftentimes we're blind for what is coming down the road. The second thing is, is oftentimes we're using the wrong map. How you guide your life is often dictated by the best commercials. And we know this, that during the Super Bowl, you know, people love to tune in for the commercials that are trying to sell you something, trying to tell you how you are are lacking. Wouldn't it be great to have the right map? Somebody once said, if you want to find the right road, you have to have the right map. What is the right map? that will guide your life? What map is guiding it now? And finally, we often get lost because we're following the wrong crowd. When you don't know what to do, when you feel lost, you'll do what everybody else is doing. Right? This is the story. I, I, I've been told that lemmings don't really fall off of a cliff like this, um, but we use that image of everybody just follows everybody else. What's the crowd doing? And oftentimes, following the crowd is the long, wrong thing to do. So this is where we were going today. If I can inspire you and believe that you were made for more but not give you the tools, techniques, and tips to get you there, you often find frustration. Inspiration without application leads to frustration. So I want to give you some tools. This, this, this is the, the, the crux of what, what I'm talking about. 
how to change your life. If you believe that you were made for more, then I want to give you the tools to get you there. But then the choice is fully in your hands. Okay? That's, that's my goal. So, I do want to let you know um, that I'm trying to do something different. And so, um, a lot of this is in the sermon notes, which are out there in the hallway, which, by the way, were printed and handled with rubber gloves. So, they're about as sterile as I can get them to be. By the way, if you were watching this online and you go to the church's website under the blog, all of the sermon notes are posted there as well, and you can just download them as a PDF, okay? So here's what I want to do. Have you ever had this place where you've, this, this is something that happened to us recently when we went to visit our daughter in, in uh, Cleveland. Everywhere you go, you got to have Google Maps, if you're going to travel in a big city with all of the highways and you don't know where to go and it is easy to get lost and people are flying by, do you ever get out on a highway on, um, I think it was like 471 around Cleveland and just say, well, everybody else is going this way. I must just go this way. I'll just follow the rest of the cars and find out where they're going. and I'll just go where they're going. But that's not your destination. So I want to give you something called GPS for those people among us who are what I call directionally challenged. Are you directionally challenged? In a time of chaos, in a time of turmoil, where do we go from here? What do we do? And I love Google or uh, the Maps app because it will talk to you. Now, you have to listen to it, you have to hear what it says, and then what? You have to do what it says. But even if you get lost, even if you make the wrong turn, even if you get anxious and you go off the wrong exit, it will do what? Recalculating, I'll get you back. It may take you a little longer, but I'll get you back where you need to be. Unless, of course, you turn it off. So we don't want to do that. So I want to give you a GPS. Now, the reason for this is every week, for those of you that want to go, every week I'm going to give you the, your GPS for that week to get you to where you want to be. But it is up to you to make that decision. The first one is, is the G, right? GPS, Global Positioning Satellite. Right? Well, let's, let's, if you don't mind, let's tweak it. Where do we start? We gotta start with true north. We gotta start with God. Every day. Align yourself to true north. Think about yourself going on an adventure. Think about yourself, you're going to discover, the Amer you're going from Europe to America. You're out in the middle of the sea, you have no idea. If you don't know which direction is true north and you say, yeah, but I'm making great time in the wrong direction, right? You're gonna die in the middle of the ocean unless you head in a specific direction. You have to know where true north is. In Proverbs chapter three, it says, in all of your ways, Submit to him or acknowledge God, and he will make your paths straight. How many of you would love to have your day-to-day -day plans made straight? I know who I am. I know what the day is about. Make your path straight. In Isaiah chapter 42, God is speaking. He said, I will lead them by ways they have not known. Along unfamiliar paths, I will guide them. I will turn their darkness into light before them and make the rough places smooth. These are the things that I will do. I will not forsake them. God is promising you to guide you on your day to day if you begin by aligning yourself to true north. Because here's the problem in your day to day events, you get confused, you get twisted, you get. Uh, manipulated by clever marketing or by anxiety or stress or all of the stuff that's in the news. And so many people are so anxious and so upset by what they're hearing on the news because you've lost your true north. You have forgotten the direction to head. This is true north. This is true north. That's why I was, thought it was so funny to have somebody say, no, you need to go out and find your own true north. Your true north may be different than mine. The Bible's going, no, it is always the same for everyone. Because there is one God and one Lord, there is one true north. Finding the right path means having the right map. What is your map? So what is, how do you do that? 
it, it's one thing to say, hey, find true north. It's another thing to figure it out. This is true north. God has written it down for you. Now, what I'm encouraging you to do is find a passage of Scripture, just something small, right? Something small. What, what I don't want you to do is say, I'm going to read the next 10 chapters every day. That would just be overwhelming, and you would quit in no time. Every day, intentionally, take a passage of Scripture that has stood for the millennia and, and digest it. Think about it, right? For example, everybody knows John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believe in him would not die but have everlasting life. Think about that. Just that's true north. God's word is my true north. Despite what everybody else, despite what your emotions are, God said, this is the direction to head. Think about it. Align yourself with true north. If you have the right map, you will find the right path. God will show it to you. Start every day with God. Because if you don't, something else will insert itself and make it your true north. Okay? First one, what's the G? Start with God. Start with God. Second one, start with prayer. Assess your current reality. See, so often what I'm finding is that people think about prayer by saying, yeah, but I don't need anything today. I mean, why would I pray if I don't need anything? Because it is a, your time to assess current reality. What is your current reality? And I'm not saying that you go on these long, flowery prayers. Just say, God, help me this day. Something simple. Something that acknowledges the day that you're about to have. This is the passage that I love. Devote yourselves to prayer. Be watchful and thankful. Be watchful. What, what's going on in your life today? What are your fears? What are your hopes? What are your anxieties? Because once you do that, you give that plan to God. You assess the current reality. What are the winds that are blowing? A couple of weeks ago, I did a message about sailing. Which direction are the winds blowing in your life? Have you ever thought about that? What are the opportunities that you have before you? What are your challenges? What is God trying to teach you today? God, today we can face anything together. Think about this as just a very simple prayer. Good morning, Lord. It's me again. It's a great day, a chance for a fresh start. Yesterday is gone, and I've learned a lot from it. Today is a good day to be alive and to give thanks, and I do, Lord. Thank you for today, a new opportunity to be all that you want me to be. Amen. Here's what happens. When you align yourself to true north, you assess your current reality, you recognize that God is impacting you on a day-to-day -day basis. And so you anticipate it. You look for it. You say, today, God is going to do something in my life that's going to be powerful. The problem is, is how many Christians go to work every day, their mission field, and never really take God with them, never take their Christianity with them? Because for them, Christianity, how hard can it be? I do it every Sunday, and it doesn't seem to, to be a big deal. All right? Number one, align yourself with true north. Number two, assess your current reality. And number three, serve. Now, that doesn't mean going, you know, to the, to the food pantry or to the homeless shelter. That means make someone's day better. Today, today, I am going to make somebody's day better. Maybe it's just to smile. That's it. Maybe it's just saying, hey, you look, you look great today. How are you doing? I really appreciate what you're... But you become intentional by setting your sails. This is one of the things that happens in, in sailing, right? It doesn't matter what your intentions are. If you don't raise the sail, you ain't going anywhere. If you don't become active, nothing ever changes. So be intentional about today, I am going to be a positive force in the world. You see, so often we become bombarded with negativity. I want to show you how bad things are in the world. 
And yet we are able to say that God is doing a good thing through all of us. Okay, so imagine using this analogy of sailing. The first thing that you have to do is you have to adjust your sails. What are the pressures that you're under? What are the concerns in your life? How can you make somebody else's life better so that you are proactive, you are actively being a positive force in life and not just reacting to all the negativity? Second, you have to adjust your rudder. Maybe you need to make some adjustments. Maybe you need to watch your language a little bit. Maybe your words have been a little bit more cutting. And just ask yourself, have I made somebody's life today a little bit better, a little bit brighter? No matter what you faced, God allowed you to be a positive force. And finally, adjust your vision. If you remember, when I talked about boating, I talked about this strange little thing that's under the boat that you don't see that's called the keel. The keel is what keeps your boat upright. And I said, every time that you kind of cut out and just, you know, you say, I don't need that and I don't need that, you whittle away at your keel. This is how you build your keel back up. By recognizing that you are more than just a cog in the the machine. That you're just allowing things to happen. You are a positive force in the world. So here's the thing, right? This is your GPS, and I'm going to try and put these out for those of you that want to go, for those of you that feel called to something more but don't know how to get there. If you do this, I guarantee you, guarantee, if you do this every day, a small scripture, God's word in my life. If you say a prayer, God, help me through this day and let me be a blessing to others. Say, not a long, flowery prayer, just something simple, but recognizing your connection to your spiritual life. And then you go out and you become active. You do something positive in the world, and you do it consistently, it will transform your world. Transform it. But here's the problem. So you ask, why, why don't we do this? Why don't we do this? because we feel how hard can it be. This Christianity stuff is simple, right? We just show up and go through the motions. Here's the problem with the summit. Reading from Jeremiah chapter six, this is God speaking to us. For those of you that feel that it's not that hard, looking across the challenges, the opportunities, what God sees in you, he says the following. This is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient path. Ask, where is the good way? And walk in it. And you will find rest for your souls. But you said, we will not walk in it. When that hit me, when that verse hit me, especially in relationship to this, God has made these promises. He said, I can make your life infinitely better, infinitely richer, more noble and more glorious than you can even imagine. All you have to do is walk in the ancient path. And they said, we will not walk in it. We will not go in that direction. And so we look to the future. We look to discipleship. We look to our church and the opportunities, and we recognize that it is much more challenging than what we thought. God is inviting us to do even more, to become even more. And I want to invite you on that journey. Next time, we're going to be taking a look at the ultimate, what God has in store for you if you're willing to go the distance. It really is a lot harder than just showing up. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise that you have not given up on us but continue to use us Stir within us a passion for the kingdom. Help us to rekindle the flame that may have gone out. And I pray for all those that have gathered here and those that are on on this new technology that they will feel your presence resonate within them, that they feel the energy and the excitement to do even more. Father, help us to follow your voice into this new world. In Jesus' name, amen.